just going to call my slides up here. So give me a minute to get those up for everyone. And at this point, I hope you can all see a slide that says uh, Gaming the Non-Kinetic. Okay, you can. So thank you very much for, for this invitation. Um, I've enjoyed listening to, uh, to the various presentations you've had. It's been a, a terrific uh, roster, other than me. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a pleasure to be here talking about this subject. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about why game the non-kinetic. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to game the non-kinetic, but mainly in this session, I'm going to run through a series of examples of games that I've run at the university for clients or otherwise, and talk through some of the game design logic involved with those. Because as you will see, there is no way, single way of, of gaming uh, non-kinetic operations. It very much depends on, on what the subject is and, and what you're trying to do. And I think perhaps the most interesting way and the most useful way of exploring all of this is to talk about why particular games were, were designed in particular ways for, for particular objectives. Um, I might stop in the middle of that from time to time to take questions, but as you correctly pointed out, Robert, there'll be a, a Q&A period at the end. So let's start, um, and that's of course a great transition for war games, isn't it? Um, let's start with, with why game the, the non-kinetic. Um, kinetic operations are, are military operations in which stuff is blowing other stuff up, and obviously it's the, the primary focus of, of most war games. But even if we think about kinetic operations, making kinetic operations work involve a whole series of non-kinetic enablers, um, command and control and communications, uh, computer, cyber, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, the logistics to make sure that everything is where it needs to be to blow things up. And of course, uh, questions of, 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 of psychology, of morale and leadership are all critically important in conducting military operations. Above and beyond even this, um, all military operations occur in a broader political diplomatic framework. Um, the, the conduct of war is the conduct of predominantly kinetic operations in a non-kinetic context for purposes of, of foreign policy and diplomacy to achieve a variety of overwhelmingly uh, political objectives, a point that of course Klaus Fitz underscored in, in On War. Even if we think about what the military does, much of what the military does, and in Canada, most of what the military does most of the time, are what we might call less and non-kinetic missions. They're things like counterinsurgency, or stabilization operations, in which if you're doing them well, kinetic actions are only part of the operation. There's a great deal of other stuff you're doing in the political, social, and economic domain, in the information domain, that is just as important in achieving the desired end state. Things like uh, non-combatant uh, evacuation operations or peacekeeping operations, if you're doing them well, in fact, you're not doing kinetic operations. So usually the less kinetic they are, the better the operation is, is going. And finally, things like humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, if you're doing anything kinetic, you're doing the mission wrong um, at the, the furthest end of the spectrum. So one reason to, to be gaming non-kinetic threats or the non-kinetic aspects of threats is because it's important. It's important for enabling conventional military operations, and it's an important part of what militaries do that don't involve uh, direct combat. Another argument, obviously, for gaming non-kinetic things is provided by reality right now. Uh, the biggest threat we're all currently facing is a non-kinetic one. It's one of pandemic virus response, something that had been amply gamed in the years running up to the, the current COVID-19 pandemic crisis, um, and in which those games clearly did not prepare us in the way we might hope they would do. Uh, for a more efficient uh, response, both both in, in national environments and, and internationally. So there are a great many really important non-kinetic things to which games can be usefully applied. They, of course, don't have to be big and important things like a global pandemic. Uh, we see in the business world, 
games being used uh, to, uh, to explore business options. Uh, one of the best presentations at Connections UK a couple of years ago was about the mar marketing of Dutch cheeses and how games played an important role in global marketing decisions. Uh, games are used in the humanitarian assistance uh, community and there's a great report out by, by Matt Stevens and, and Tom Fisher on that that's on PacSims now on, on the application of games for humanitarian training. So games generally have a lot of things that they can do well. It, it, they're, this is a war game society and, and it focuses on war games, but there's many things that games can offer insight into. Uh, games can be, whether they're war games or they're not about war at all, can be useful tools for experiential learning. And indeed, if you look, for example, in the medical field, I would argue that they're well ahead of the rest of us in terms of using games and simulations for, for training purposes. Uh, games, whether war games or otherwise, can be useful tools for analysis. They're useful ways of crowdsourcing ideas from from participants. They're a useful way of examining player interaction and, and how and why they make various strategic choices. Uh, they can be useful for exploring the, the future. And there's some fairly robust uh, evidence in the forecasting literature that people who gain through a conflict situation tend to gain better insight as to how it will unfold to those who just, compared to those who just read about the scenario and, and, and think about it that way. And finally, of course, many of us game for fun. Uh, so another reason for game design, and certainly the reason behind some of my game designs, is not for some serious educational uh, purpose purpose or some serious analytical purpose, but because we enjoy it, uh, enjoy um, doing it. So let me, let me move on to the question of what things need to be considered in designing a game that's predominantly about non-kinetic issues, issues that don't involve the direct application of, of military force or in which the application of military force is only part of the process or is even secondary or tertiary to the process. And I think the most important trick in designing games of this sort is there is no trick. Um, there's no magic to designing a non-kinetic game. It is simply the principles of, of good game design. The very first thing, and I get asked fairly frequently for input or advice or consultation or work on designing games that aren't predominantly about the application of military force. The most important question you need to ask first is what are you trying to do? And do you even need a game for that? Because I have to say, I frequently tell people who, who to consult me that actually a game is not the best way of trying to get at the answer they want to get at. Um, sometimes they want a game because it's trendy or it sounds fun or because someone else had a game. Um, and it's not always the best way of generating an answer. It's not always the best way of teaching people, people either. So at the very beginning, you've got to be really clear on what your purpose is and whether a game will, can support that purpose or whether there are more cost-effective cost ways of addressing that purpose. Secondly, and it may sound funny to have number two before we even think about the game system, but I think you have to consider the material constraints, the conditions under which the game will be designed and played before you think about how you're gonna run the game. How much time do you have? Do they need it tomorrow? Uh, or do you have six months? Um, who are your participants? Do you get to choose your participants? Will you be assigned participants? What do your participants know? How senior are they? Are there any issues, any tensions with your participants? Um, I've run games in which the participants themselves are engaged in a conflict with each other and there are enormous political sensitivities involved. Um, how much time will your participants give? How much attention will they give or will they be disappearing off to deal with important issues in the middle of your, of your game. How much playing time do you have, which is related sometimes to who your participants are? I mean, do you have them for a few hours? Do you have them for a few days? Uh, what is your budget? What support, material supports do you have? What is the location where you have to run it? And now, of course, in the, in the pandemic period, we often have to think about what game system can we run in a, in a virtual environment? Um, 
What about security and classification issues, uh, which can be a real constraint on game design? Do you have to run it in a particular place? Do you have to run it with particular IT supports? Can you not use Zoom because someone will complain about security uh, in a distributed game, even an unclassified uh, distributed game? So all of those material constraints need to be thought about before you even start to think what the game will look like because they will have a really fundamental effect on what the game design uh, looks like. Then you start thinking about what game system best addresses this. What are the variables, the choice, what, the, the, what is your model of the issue? What are the, the variables that drive the issue? What are the sorts of choices that participants should have to choose from? Um, and how will the structuring of the problem into a model um, illuminate the issues that you hope the game will illuminate. Or if it's a game being designed for fun, uh, will, the, will that model support interesting choices and interesting play that will keep players uh, engaged and keep them wanting to, to play it? And finally, uh, you wanna think about Jim Dunnigan's two golden rules of, of war game design, but it applies to all game design, which is keep it simple and plagiarize. Uh, don't keep adding additional chrome and fluff and complication to the game to the point that it becomes unplayable, which is very easy to do because you're constantly thinking of new things that you could address in the game. Uh, you don't want to do that for playability reasons. Often you don't want to do that for educational or analytical reasons because if there's too much going on in the game, if it's too difficult for players to discern cause and effect, if it's too difficult for analysts after the game to discern cause and effect, you may not have actually delivered your educational or, or analytical uh, objectives. And plagiarize, are there, are there cool game mechanisms out there that would be appropriate? Do you don't have to reinvent the wheel? I will, however, put a bit of an asterisk on plagiarize. Um, the downside of doing that, and I think all of us who ever design games are inspired by game mechanisms we've seen used elsewhere, that you do have to watch that you don't reflexively apply the game system you grew up with to the problem you're given. If you're examining global pandemic response, you do not need hexes and you do not need a CRT. Um, just because you might have grown up on Avalon Hill and SPI games does not mean that that's the gaming approach that's going to work for the a particular non-kinetic issue. So I'm always, when I teach gaming, I'm always encouraging students to, to play games and learn from games and learn interesting mechanisms that might work, but also warning them about taking a game model which really doesn't work very well, but they're used to it and just sort of applying it without much critical thought to the problem they're trying to explore. You have to make the usual choices, and this is all pretty much War Game 101, I'm sure, to, to most or all of you, about how you're going to adjudicate. Um, are you going to have a, a rigid Craigspiel in which everything is pre-written in the rules? Are you going to have a free Craigspiel in which it's going to be up to umpires? Are you going to have some mix of those? Because you can certainly mix them in a lot of professional games. Are you going to use a matrix game in which it's not the rules that are deciding outcomes because there really aren't any rules and it's not the umpires that are deciding outcomes because there's not really an umpire. It's the player themselves determining outcomes by a variety of methods, but most of which involve polling the players for some kind of probability or some kind of list of enabling and constraining conditions and working out uh, success or failure of an action from that. We, we could spend an entire session talking about matrix games. I tend to use them a lot. Uh, they're, they're quick, they're dirty, they're easy to design. They can be very useful for some things and they're completely inappropriate for others. Most uh, commercial hobby games are, are rigid games and they're turn-based games. Uh, that is to say there's written rules and, and the turns are structured. But of course you can also have, and a lot of digital games are continuous games in which you're, you're playing in some kind of real time or, or scaled real time. You can have synchronous or asynchronous play. The players may all be playing at the same time or they may be playing at, at different times. And of course, there's a question of whether you're going to do your game in, in a manual or a, a digital environment. I'm gonna mention again the, the report that, that uh, 
Tom and Matt produced on, on humanitarian gaming because it has a really interesting kind of experiment-based research on the relative strengths of digital game systems and manual game systems in this case for, for educating and training around humanitarian aid issues. Now, one thing that perhaps is not unique to non-kinetic games, but which is a characteristic of a great many non-kinetic games is that they are semi-cooperative. Now, there are uh, lots of adversarial games out there, and most commercial hobby war games are adversarial. You're playing against each other, whether it's the Cold War and Twilight Struggle, or it's infantry combat and advanced squad leader. Um, Warfare is, is in many ways um, uh, adversarial. There's some complications when we get into stabilization operations. Um, and when there are some cooperative games out there, a pandemic, appropriately enough, given our current situation, is a cooperative game. Um, but the design space where a lot of my games fit, and I think this applies to a lot of non-kinetic games, is in fact a semi-cooperative space. Uh, and that's in fact where a lot of stuff in life really happens. Um, the players kind of have some similar goals, but they have some different goals. And it's not that if I win, you lose, but it's not that we're necessarily on the same team and maybe I can win and you can lose, but maybe we can both win. Maybe that's to be determined. Maybe some of us can win and some of us can lose. Um, peace and stabilization operations can be like this. Almost everyone can want peace, but they differ on what peace looks like, how power is distributed, how resources are distributed, how problems are solved. And even humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations, which are very cooperative in the sense that we all want to save lives, there can be significant differences about how you do things, what order you do things, uh, the political consequences for the host countries of doing things in different ways. Uh, there can be divisions within the country over who gets what resources and so on and so forth. Um, if one thinks about pandemic response in the United States, it's clear that it's a bit of a semi-cooperative game in which everyone's on the same side of, in defeating COVID-19, but occasionally one party might seize respirators that were ordered by another party. I have to say in Canada, it's been much more of a, of a, of a cooperative game. That's not true about everything in Canada, but it, but it has been on, on pandemic response. And I think there are some really interesting issues around how you design a semi-cooperative game. So the easiest way of doing this is asymmetrical win conditions and win conditions that sort of capture you can both win or some of you can win and some of you can, can not win. In, in Aftershock, a, a game I'll talk about later, it's possible for everyone to win, it's possible for no one to win, and it's possible for some people to win and some people to lose. And that's a case of formally baking the semi-cooperative nature of the game into the victory points, into the, into the payoff structure of the game. You can also achieve some of this with asymmetrical capabilities. If your players are very different in what they can do, even in a cooperative game, they'll tend to silo a bit and they'll tend to view the game through the perspective of what it is they can do or not do. Um, and that will tend to generate a certain amount of, of asymmetry and, and semi-cooperation. Um, those are what we might call game theoretic approaches because particularly with the first one, you're manipulating payoff structures to manipulate human behavior. The, the last three, however, are really the sweet spot, I think, for um, semi-cooperative game design in which players are imperfectly cooperating. They're both cooperating and their rivals because of the ways you've manipulated information because of the difficulties of coordinating and because of the way they get sucked into the game narrative that encourages them to get annoyed with each other, angry with each other, have problems agreeing on what to do, and so on and so forth. Um, and here we're really manipulating player psychology more than we're directly manipulating the, the payoff matrix uh, for, the, for the game. I'll apologize that, that, that both my Figures on the right there are middle-aged white males, which is a bit of a problem in wargaming generally, but uh, it's a bit of a problem in clip art, as free clip art as well, as you can see. Um, and so I think to the extent that anything is unusual in semi-co-op, in, uh, sorry, in non-kinetic game design, it's not really the fundamental steps of, of designing a game. It is perhaps this interesting design space 
of often trying to recreate situations in which people are kind of on the same side some of the time about some stuff, but other things they bitterly disagree about and some of them might win and others might lose, but it's not clear if everyone can win or everyone can lose. Um, and, and that I think is a really interesting place to design games. So having said that, what I'm gonna do now is just talk through some games and they're all gonna be my games, not because my games are, are particularly excellent, but because they're the ones where I understand the design decisions that, that went into them. And I'm gonna start with what is the most orthodox game from a hobby game point of view, which is, which is Aftershock, which is a game about humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. It first grew out of a Connections US Wargaming Conference in which we had a game lab on the Haiti earthquake and there were a lot of good ideas. So I thought, I bet I could design a board game around this. Um, and so in conjunction with a lot of other people, uh, including Tom Fisher, who's in on the call, as well as a bunch of students at McGill, uh, who were my play testers. A great thing about being at university is it usually takes, when there's not a pandemic, about 10 minutes to find play testers. You just post on Facebook, you need play testers and they all volunteer. Um, we published a, a you know box board game. It's published by the Game Crafter, which is a cooperative game, or semi-cooperative game rather, um, about humanitarian assistance and, and disaster relief. And, and there you can see on the far right, it being played in the US military, the one next to that, it being used to train humanitarian aid workers, the one next to that, it being used by the Chileans in, in teaching Latin American officers about, about peace operations. So, game about humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. Designed for education, um, can also be played for fun. I think it's a quite fun game, others may disagree. It's four-sided, although each of those sides can be more than one actual participant. The, the sweet spot is probably eight, but we usually run it between four and 12 divided into, into teams of uh, four teams. Semi-cooperative, two hours of playtime. And it's absolutely two hours of playtime because you usually play it, or I certainly usually play it on a clock. And that was because it has to fit in a three hour seminar, which is a sort of standard teaching slot in, in, in many places. So that's enough time to brief the game, run the game and do some, do some debrief. It had very common game mechanisms that people play games will recognize. Resource allocation problem. You're you're trying to solve, uh, address humanitarian needs in districts of the, of the country. Uh, there's worker placement. You're moving your teams around. You can see the little avatars, the little meeples on there. Uh, there are recipes. Each district needs something different uh, in order to be resolved. There's some long-term planning, and that you really have to decide kind of turn in advance what you're bringing in, and you need to think about what everyone else is doing. There are no dice in the game. Here's an interesting design. Uh, choice because aid workers don't like dice. They, they tend to feel it's a little demeaning to decide if people live or die by, by a die roll, or it seems too childish. It seems like monopoly or, or snakes and ladders. So in some professional settings, using dice can be a problem. In some professional settings, dice can be a, a cultural problem if they have a cultural association with, uh, with, with gambling. That can be true in some very conservative parts of the Middle East, although not generally in the Middle East, so we, we didn't put any dice in it. There's, there's randomized card draws, which amount to the same thing, but, uh, but, but no dice. So you can see rigid game, semi-cooperative, small number of players, fixed play time, it was intended to be a board game, so it was a board game. Um, it's not necessarily the only way of, of, uh, of teaching coordination in a humanitarian disaster, but it works fairly well. It gets used fairly, fairly, uh, fairly widely. Uh, we're quite happy with it, and since all the profits go to UN humanitarian agencies, it's also raised several thousand dollars for the World Food Program and, and others, which is, uh, which is terrific. So that's one game approach. And now I'm gonna to shift to the entire end, other end of the spectrum and talk about another, which is the peace building simulation that I usually run in my peace building course at McGill. It got canceled by the pandemic this year. Uh, but it's set in Brynania, which is just named after me because it's, it's, it's my game. So I, I thought I would set it in Brynania. And I know that there are a few veterans of Brynania, including one former president of the Republic, um, uh, in the in the call at the moment. So Brightania is absolutely not a rules-based board game. It's at the complete other end of the spectrum. The, the topic here is complex peace operations, 
the purpose is educational. And really what I was trying to do here was to highlight how extraordinarily difficult peace operations are. Because I teach a course, uh, in that course they're reading all the UN and other best practices guidelines on repatriating refugees or disarming combatants or negotiation with armed groups, whole series of checklists and procedures and some really great resource materials. And in real life, it's way more complicated than that and it never works out neatly. So I needed some way after, at this point, usually about 10 weeks of teaching to highlight to students how complicated it is in real life, given the multiplicity of actors and the multiplicity of interests and capabilities involved. This is multiplayer, semi-free Craig Spiel. Some rules are written, but for the most part, it's up to me. Uh, both direct and distributed play, they meet, they run around campus, they email, they text, they chat, they voice over IP, they interact however they want. All kinds of different aspects of the game, resource distribution, a lot of negotiation. Some of it is turn-based, some of it is continuous. So for 12 hours a day, it's playing in continuous time, and then overnight, it shifts to turn-based. 100 plus players and 70 hours of play over a week. So while students are in their other classes, they're simultaneously in a game that runs 12 hours a day, most days of the week, slightly less on a, on, a, on a weekend, playing just about everyone that would be involved in a peace operation. The government, insurgents, regional government, civil society, aid groups, UN agencies, donors, troop contributing countries, the media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it is, it is massive, it is massive. I typically read 15,000, 10 to 15,000 emails um, that week, and the last time I ran it, so not this year, but the year before, I was in 40 plus simultaneous Facebook chat groups monitoring student interaction. I, my wife literally brings me food at the, at the computer that week because I can't get away from the, from the game. So don't ever do this at home. It's kind of crazy. It, it, it grew and grew and grew and grew. But here the purpose is really to overwhelm players with complexity and noise as a counterpoint to the much more antiseptic treatment of peace operations in their written materials, in their, in their, their course readings and in the lectures. And it works very well for, for, for that. Um, uh, extensive debrief at the end over, over two classes plus a written debrief because there's so much to unpack during the course of the simulation. On the left, you can see a, a couple of documentaries on it. One is by McGill, which is well done, a bit dull. Uh, the other one was done by some of my students um, who've gone on to become television producers, both of them, um, in 2010. And actually, I think it gives a better sense of, of the frenetic pace of the, the simulation. All kinds of different outcomes over the years, even though the scenarios remain the same. Of course, the globe has changed, but uh, the scenario has been the same from successful peace operations and transitional elections to continued civil war. Now, the reason I flagged those numbers at the bottom, there is a fairly complex algorithm in the game that calculates how many people die, allows me to compare student performance from year to year. And like a lot of civil wars, it's not the military who are doing most of the dying. It's predominantly people dying from the economic and social impacts of the war. In this case, uh, food security, famine, uh, epidemic disease, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so most of what's important in this game is non-kinetic. There's certainly players blowing stuff up. You saw a military deployment map a couple slides ago. All that military stuff is going on, but, but really what, where life and death is hinging is on humanitarian access, stabilization, reducing the level of violence so that the economy can, can operate and so that aid donors can get humanitarian access to, to uh, famine-affected um, and epidemic-affected regions of the, of the country. So um, I'll just stop for a second here. And if anyone has any questions on those two games in particular, I'll answer them before going on. If it's a more general question about the genre, let's leave it to the end. But if there's any hot pursuit questions right now on that, um, I'll take them. And I'm hearing silence. So I might assume, Robert, there are none. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions right now. Again, uh, next minute or two, if anybody has any, feel free to throw them into the chat there. Okay, so well, yeah. I'll, go on to, I'll go on to the next one. But I've started with those two because they kind of bookcase the non-kinetic gaming experience from something that I think most hobby war gamers or gamers would recognize as a game, 
to something which is a, a much more free form role play uh, negotiation game going on intensely for a very extended period of time with a very large number of, of participants. So the next thing I want to move on to is a game that we largely run for fun at McGill or games because they're never the same uh, each year at McGill, which is which is uh, McGill Make a Game. Uh, Sebastian was was in the last one. Rex, uh, I don't um, to interrupt you. We have one quick question here about yeah. the last two games. Yeah. So the uh, question is: Is Bernania available to other educators to teach? Um, I can make some of the materials available. I, I'm happy to make some of the materials available. What's happened over the years is I've written stuff up, but my students have also written stuff up. So there are, for example, a good dozen songs recorded by campus bands over the last 20 years, which are set in the fictional universe of, of Brynania. There's excerpts from a fake Harry Potter novel set in the Brynania universe. I mean, I have a lot of stuff that students have generated. They're, they're, they're real keeners at McGill when they get into this. Um, so I'm happy to provide some of the materials. A lot of it, frankly, is in my head as well. So it, it's not necessarily written down. I, I've, I've run it you know, 17, 18 times, uh, but I'm happy to do so. But if you're looking for a pre-made scenario, another place to go is to look at the various Karana scenarios, which are used by the UN system for exercises, they're used by the World Bank for exercises, and they're used by the African Union for exercises. Um, now, somewhat confusingly, they all use slightly different versions of Karana that they've tweaked for their own purposes. Some Karana materials can be found online, particularly the African Union version of it. It's not terribly hard to find the, the PDF briefing. Um, and I've used that for things as well, um, because it does have a lot of detail. And the nice thing is you can say, this is actually a setting that's used by real world peacekeepers uh, and, and responders in, in developing skills uh, and developing cooperation for, for humanitarian action or peacekeeping operations or, or responsibility to, to protect interventions and so on and so forth. But if you email me, if someone emails me afterwards, I'm, I'm happy to sort of suggest where you can look uh, for scenario uh, material. And we have one more question um, regarding Brynania. Um, specifically, how do, you how do you calculate the casualties? You so for, um, for casualties due to, to economic and, and social reasons, there is a uh, spreadsheet-based algorithm that looks at the degree of damage in the area to economic infrastructure, IDP, pres inter internally displaced persons, road access, the amount of money that agencies are spending, how effective those agencies have proven to be in terms of the program design, and a bunch of other variables, and it spits out a number. Um, I can't claim any verification or validation of the numbers, other than the numbers are about right for a situation of that sort. Um, and because the algorithms are constant from, from year to year, uh, the casualties go up when students are less effective at gaining access to the most effective regions or when their program design is less effective than in previous years or if there's duplication or, or roads aren't opened or, or other kinds of things. So the, the, the humanitarian losses are, are based on a, on a rigid algorithm. The military losses uh, come out of my head. Um, I essentially set odds and then roll dice for, for military confrontations, and they're sort of scaled to my best judgment. So those are judgment-based. The humanitarian numbers are, are algorithm-based. So additionally, uh, going back to the question about uh, instruction, um, is it possible to use the game in an online virtual format to kind of work with the, the current COVID situation? Yeah, I mean, when we run Brightania, a good, it's hard to quantify, half to two thirds of it is digital. That is to say, people are communicating by email, particularly for formal communication. Uh, people are sitting in chat rooms, people are set up, setting up Skype or FaceTime or, or, or what have you meetings. So already a lot of it is virtual. There, there is in-person negotiation. I mean, the peace talks are almost always an actual physical meeting, for example. Um, one could, do that virtually. Um, if anyone wants to do this, do not start with 100 students in seven days. Um, I didn't. I started with a dozen students and two days and then slowly, slowly scaled it up over time um, until I reached uh, much more than 100, the number of dyads, the number of potential interactions, and hence the number of email traffic and, and what have you they generate just becomes too much for me to monitor. So at that point, I'm, I'm 
I mean, as it is, I get about four hours sleep a, week, a, a day that week. But um, if you start small, yeah, you absolutely can do this. And in real life, I mean, for anyone who's ever worked at a, a, a State Department or a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or for that matter, in the military, an awful lot of communications is going to be digital. It's, it's going to be email and so forth. So it's not, it's not unrealistic to take a peace building scenario and make even all of it or a very great deal of it um, email and, and voice over IP or Zoom or what have you. Um, there are some specialist e-learning platforms you can use to support this kind of things. I don't use them. I simply use university email, although the university creates special accounts for my students so they're not having to use their regular accounts. Um, because it's robust, it's an internal system, so it's not subject to a server crashing somewhere else or, or Google having service problems. Um, and I leave it to students otherwise how to communicate because it is one thing that my university students know how to do, it's how to communicate. I, mean, I don't need to give them software because, you know, between the 58 different ways that they interact with each other, they can always find some way of communicating. Um, but if you wanted to do it on a Zoom, if you want to do some of it on, on Zoom or Microsoft Teams or what have you, uh, major, maybe the major meetings, one could certainly do it. So one last question actually related to your mention of your students. Uh, so in the course of developing a game like this, how do you as an instructor develop the sort of depth of engagement that you've described, the creative role fulfillment that you talked about, students creating supplements and building upon uh, the game itself, things like that? You know, that, that has not been a problem. In fact, the, the course participation in the simulation is only worth 10% of the course grade in a normal year, and then the debrief is another 10%. I don't even have to incentivize it much. Uh, part of what helps is it's hard to get into the course because it fills up really quickly. So almost everyone in the course uh, is really keen to be in the course because they've heard about this, the simulation. It's a, it's a bit of a legend. Um, so I end up with a bunch of keen students. Um, it's very immersive. People get genuinely angry. Um, uh, my colleague, Brianna Prosiviat, who's, who's one of the editors at Paxims and works at the uh, Canadian Forces Joint Warfare Center as a war game designer. Uh, she was president of Brynania when she was almost assassinated in a terrorist incident, and I remember how furious she was. She was just steaming, um, you know, even though it was just a game. She, I don't think she's forgiven Harrison for that um, yet. Uh, so, I mean, they really get into it. They get angry. I see a lot of the private communications because literally everything has to be copied to me. And, you know, the, the tension becomes real. The feeling of injustice becomes real. Now, there's a lot of supporting material. There's a lot of cultural artifacts. There's a lot of traditions. Um, and students will have heard it from other students who are in the class in previous years. But I have to say, in my experience, I found university students to be very keen game players. I, mean, I don't really have much of a problem with, with free writing and people not wanting to do it. Excellent. So we actually just had one uh, additional question come in. It's, it's a three-prong three -prong question about the mechanics of the game. Uh, first, what are the win conditions for the game, if any? Are they determined ahead of time, or do they depend on how the game unfolds? And finally, how do you evaluate participants' decisions? If you need to repeat any of those, just let me know. So the latter is actually, I, I think the notion, we do it in, in Aftershock because it's, it's a rigid board game and you have to, but in, in reality, the notion of what is a win condition varies with time. I mean, in, in actual conflicts, people change their goals over time to be more maximalist, maximalist or less maximalist, more minimalist, depending on how they're doing, depending on other things. Um, I mean, there are some obvious things. The, the government doesn't want to lose power. The rebels would like to get in, secede from the country and, and gain an independent state. Uh, you know, there are some things that players would like to do, but it is also designed to be a hurting stalemate. You know, classic Professor Bill Zartman stuff. Normally, peace negotiations only occur when no one can can win, and that they don't they're they're hurting in the current situation. So it's a hurting stalemate. So they usually have to have to compromise, and the evolution of their goals um, is interesting. It's not even clear that a single side has the same goals. Often, the government of Brynania and sometimes the rebel movement will rip themselves apart with fratricidal differences over what their goals should be, how much they should compromise, what they should give away. It's not unusual for the defense minister to storm out when he has to start demobilizing forces or give up terrain. And we've had more than one coup against the, the president and more than one coup against the rebel leadership when differences occur. So I think it's really important not to rigidly set 
the goals in a, in a game like that, because I think in real life, those goals uh, change over time. In terms of assessing decisions, I'm able to process trace most of the decisions. And that becomes important because it's not always clear to players everything that was going on. There's a lot of hidden information, uh, not me hiding it, players hiding it from other players. And it's quite revealing at the end when we, when we track through the decisions about who did what when and, and what the consequences were. In their debriefs, uh, their debriefs, they, they do a, a critical evaluation of their performance, what they want to do differently. So they're also self-evaluating in terms of what worked and, and, and what, uh, what didn't work. All right, that seems to have been our last question at this point, so feel free to proceed. Okay, so let's go into the mega games. And the mega games are run for fun. Um, they're not run for serious purpose. I tend to run them on emergency management issues lately because actually they're, they kind of work for me because I'm teaching my courses around peace building at that time. And so students do actually learn something from the simulation, but you know, they're not meant to be realistic simulations of things. Uh, they are kinetic. Uh, you have military forces there. Uh, that's, that's Canadian Special uh, operations Forces Command there, uh, and it's got a lot of other stuff, police, fire departments, ambulances, critical infrastructure, those thick red lines are the Newfoundland power grid on that map on the left, medical facilities, interagency cooperation, it has all the other things that, that a real game should have, like coffee and people pointing at maps and PowerPoint and an actual red telephone and an actual former nuclear bunker because we ran one of the games in the Diefen bunker outside Ottawa. Um, and it has things that are not realistic, like zombies or rampaging lobsters. Uh, that's a rampaging angry crustacean or a rock lobster from the last game we ran in, in, in February at McGill. Um, these are usually lately eight to civil powers games. They're not non-kinetic because there's zombies and there's giant creatures. Uh, that you're trying to defeat, but there's an awful lot of non-kinetic stuff in it, from scientific research to emergency response, uh, municipal uh, challenges, multiple levels of government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, multiplayer, semi-cooperative, you're all trying to defeat the zombie menace, but you don't always agree, particularly Ontario and Quebec. Uh, Semi-rigid Craigspiel, there's a bunch of written rules. They're not onerous. Um, uh, but we also sometimes make up stuff up as we go along. Uh, emphasis on emergent gameplay. We don't always know what the players will do. And if they come up with something interesting, we, we tend to go with the flow. The, the game design is really built around interlocking sub games. So there you can see one of the regional map games um, underway. It's Nova Scotia and, and Prince Edward Island. Uh, there's also one for Newfoundland, but there's also another map that shows the maritime environment uh, which includes a shipping game. There's another map which shows critical infrastructure, which is really an electrical resource game. There's a whole series of players who are playing in a scientific research game. And those games are all run by different control players, uh, but they all fit in, in in one way or another. There's a lot of kind of model UN or, or, or LARP overtones to it um, as well. 100 players, seven hours of play. Um, and what we've tended to do recently is our adversaries, whether they're giant lobsters or Godzilla or zombies, are played by players, but those players are kind of part of the control team. And so they're not tasked to win at any cost, they're tasked to keep the players appropriately challenged through the game. So they will ease up the pressure a bit if it's becoming too much, and they'll double down within the context of the rules if they think that the players are having an easy time. And that allows us, because people are coming to this, they're giving a whole day, they're buying a ticket, they're paying for it because we have to rent the room. Um, we want to make sure they all have fun. So by using a kind of pink cell in which our red team is also part of the white cell, it allows us to moderate the challenge level in order to keep people as, as engaged as, as, as possible. Um, I, the rule set, which is not everything you need to run the game, but the rule set for Atlantic Rim, which is the kaiju giant things out of the Atlantic Ocean game, um, can be obtained from, from, from PAX Sims, provided you make a contribution to the World Health Organization. Um, I would never argue that what happens in those games is realistic, although you can run more realistic mega games. But right now, I'm quite happy that we have this sweet spot in which many of the emergency management things are, are quite accurate. So the very last game we ran, which was 
Apocalypse North. It was a zombie game in, in, in Ottawa. That has the Public Health Agency of Canada, the search for a vaccine, uh, lockdowns, and an awful lot of stuff that's happened in real life that comes up in that, that game as well. Um, then I'm going to shift to something completely different, um, which is gaming Middle East conflict. You will notice that none of those places is in the Middle East. In fact, they're all in different places in Oxfordshire. But those are the places where I, I've run this series of games. Um, these are really, really nice places. So if you want to run games, these are, you know, there's an idyllic village with one of the best pubs in, in Oxfordshire on the left in Manor in middle. And the other one is, as you can see, a stately home. Um, we can't run serious games on Middle East conflict in the Middle East because it's just politically not possible. It's not safe for participants. They can't always travel to other people's countries. And you often in serious games want to get your high level participants out of the office because if they're anywhere near their office, they will disappear or they will take an important call or they will pop out for a meeting. So we literally sequester them in Minster Lovell, that's the village on the left, um, or in Einsham Hall, uh, which is the stately home on the right, um, so that they can't communicate too well with the outside world and so we have their undivided attention. And what these games are, for the most part, as you'll see, is they are serious games that were designed to address particular ongoing issues in the Middle East, uh, analytically and in support of, of ongoing diplomatic processes. I've also run games on the Libya conflict. I ran a game in Benghazi for the Libyan opposition during the Civil War in 2011, but I don't have any nice pictures about that. And that was really just a glorified scenario discussion. So this is not the only game I've run on refugees, but we, from between 2018 and 2014, I was heavily involved in a series of track two initiatives, which are semi-official meetings designed to elicit original thought, crowdsource ideas from experts and well-connected former officials, sometimes current officials, which were then systematically fed into the official parts of the Middle East peace process. And I did this wearing at one point a Canadian government hat, at other points a McGill hat, and at other points shifted my hat depending on what was what's helpful to make the meeting happen. Um, so they were analytical games and we were trying to produce insights that we could feed into various phases of the Middle East peace process during those years. Um, we used did negotiation simulations with subject matter experts and, and well-connected Israelis and Palestinians, uh, very well-connected Israelis and Palestinians. In fact, at one point, we had to stop the Palestinians from calling uh, President Abbas in Ramallah for instructions on how to play the game. Uh, you know, we had to stop that part of the simulation because it was too well connected and we didn't want to bother him. Um, but when we ran these activities, they were attended by American, Canadian, British, EU diplomats, and there was often follow-up activity. So sometimes something interesting would come out of a game and then there'd be a series of academic seminars to sort of flesh that issue out. Now, it does have to be said that the Middle East peace process completely failed, that the situation in Israel-Palestine is worse than ever. And so this is perhaps my most disastrous failure ever, um, having spent a great deal of time on the Palestinian refugee issue, both officially and academically. Uh, but I'd like to think that the failure of the peace process wasn't, wasn't, wasn't our fault. So most of this is not publicly available. That particular report is published by, by Chatham House, but that's just the public version of, of what we did. It doesn't include all the stuff that went on or all the stuff that, that followed up. So some of these were fully games. You'd recognize them as, as negotiation games run over several days. Some of them were game elements, uh, uh, scenario testing and so forth inserted into what would otherwise be more academic discussions in order to challenge the players. And I have to say, in terms of insight elicitation, it worked quite well. The particular simulation that that report is about, one of the participants who had been chief of staff to his country's leader and had also been chief negotiator in the peace talks said stuff happened in the simulation today that I had never thought of before, um, which is either worrying because he'd been the person in charge of the negotiations or gratifying that the game in fact had produced insights that were, were worth the, the time and expense of, of getting 40 odd people to a stately home in the middle of the Oxfordshire uh, countryside. This isn't the only Middle East conflict games that I've run. Um, a few years ago, uh, we ran with UNRWA, which is the UN agency that deals with Palestinian refugees, a contingency planning game 
in to explore what they would do if the U.S. cut off support for the organization. Now, this was uh, uh, during the Obama administration, uh, but um, in fact, the Trump administration did cut off funding, so it turned out to be very prescient. Um, and here, what we were doing is, is we had three competing teams who were operating within the scenario, which we were role playing out for them. People were role playing the stakeholders and they were producing briefs to the actual head of the agency. Um, the person there that the arrow's pointing at is Filippo Grandi, who's now head of UNHCR, but at the time was head of UNRWA. Um, and he was, the, he was the actual person receiving the briefs coming out of the simulation. Uh, just to generate ideas on how the agency could, could deal with a sudden shortfall in funding. Um, we had academics, we had, we had policy SMEs, we had some graduate students there, we had people who were role-playing stakeholders, so we had a scholar of Israeli politics playing the Israeli government, we had a Palestinian political analyst playing the Palestinian Authority, we had someone from Hamas, who pretends he's not from Hamas, but he is, uh, playing Hamas. Uh, we had someone who's an expert on Jordanian politics playing Jordan. Uh, we had someone who was, had been a senior State Department official uh, playing the United States. In fact, that person called us from the airport on the way there to, uh, uh, to, to check some things about who the Hamas player would be because they were worried about the, the consequences of it. Um, and we had senior staff from the UN agency. It helps a lot when you have senior leader buy-in. I mean, in this case, the analysis was being directly digested by the head of the agency, who was also role playing himself in the simulation, which, which I think also motivated the players. They knew that any ideas they came up with were going to be seriously considered by the person who had to make the hard choices when austerity hit. Um, I've also run educational games on refugees. Uh, this is one I've run both at McGill and University of Exeter um, on Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Um, educational game. Uh, one of the things we did here is it's actually run as a two level game. In the bottom right, you can see the government level game in which Lebanese government ministry, ministers, UN personnel, uh, NGOs, or students playing those roles have to come up with a policy. And at the same time, we had a refugee survival game in which the other half of the participants were just trying to survive as Syrian refugees. So the, the official game was very much a kind of model UN negotiation game. Uh, the refugee game was very much a series of risky choices about how to survive and how to spend your money. Um, and the two games were connected. So the kinds of survival choices made by the refugees factored into the Lebanese government's um, decision making. We use some unusual mechanisms in that game to encourage player engagement. Um, in particular, it was a full day game. The students were not allowed to eat unless they'd actually bought food in the game, as to say whether they generated enough resources to uh, to feed their families, otherwise they went without food. Um, and if you got killed in the game, if you were doing something risky, like smuggling across the Syrian-Lebanese border, you had to lie face down on the floor for an hour. So there you see a student who died, um, and there is no greater disincentive to not die in a game than having to lie face down on the floor for an hour while everyone walks around you. So that mechanism worked extraordinarily well. After that, absolutely no one wanted to die because it wasn't just a case of respawning and coming back or going home, you, you lay on the floor. Nice thing about university students is they're, they're game for all of this. I must say in terms of other odd mechanisms I've used for engagement, the uh, Middle East peace process uh, negotiation simulation, we had people playing Palestinian refugees who were actual Palestinian refugees from Syria, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and the West Bank and Gaza. Um, they, unlike everyone else who was given a room um, as their home base room for their team, they had to wander the halls because they were refugees. They had no permanent place. They got kind of annoyed that no one was consulting them. Now, they were all people I know, so I could get away with doing that. But we ended up with some really pissed off refugees quite deliberately because they felt all the officials were negotiating over their head and they weren't spending the time to come and talk to them, which is in fact an actual problem in peace negotiations, that stakeholder communities can feel that the lawyers and the ministers and the insurgent leaders aren't really paying any attention to them when the peace talks uh, start. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, um, so that was, a, that was the, uh, the, the refugee game. Um, any questions on those games? I'll, I'll stop for a second um, to take questions on those games before I start talking about this. 
We have none so far, but we'll give everyone a, a minute or two if they want to send a question in, uh, a relevant question. So Rex, one question we have uh, is, do you have any particular mechanics that work well in these contexts? It was entirely dependent on what we were trying to do and how much time we had them for. So uh, the big one at Einstein Hall was very much a, a three-day conference with two days of, of kind of role-played peace negotiations, um, very Model UN in style. So anyone who ever did Model UN would recognize lots of it. Um, and you know, it was not a particularly unusual or challenging thing. What we wanted to get at in that particular game was we felt that the negotiators were not thinking through some of the implementation challenges that would be involved with the kinds of things that were under discussion in the official talks. Um, and that there was a danger um, that they could agree to something on paper that proved very difficult to implement in practice, which sometimes happens in peace agreements that, that there's agreement uh, to do X and then it turns out it's very difficult to do X. So this was us wanting to explore what the implementation challenges might actually be. And I think it, it worked very well in the fact that the UK government then financed two follow-up seminars to, to unpack some of the issues that came out of the meeting uh, was indicative of that. Some of the other ones, we had one where there was some particular negotiating language that was proving diplomatic, difficult in the diplomatic end. So we ran what was essentially a form of speed dating where, um, we would match Israelis, Palestinians, and outsiders up into groups of three, have them come up with clever bridging language for peace talks, and they'd have about half an hour, and then we'd randomly reassign them, and then we'd sort of, it was a bit of a competition as to which groups would come up with the best stuff. And that wasn't really a game, it was really using a sort of game mechanic to force people to generate actual substantive language, because a problem with track two meetings, a problem with meetings, is that people like to talk and they take a very long time to come up with specific proposals. So sometimes we simply use game mechanisms as a way of forcing people to actually come up with concrete proposals that we could then bat around and evaluate and test and discuss, as opposed to what often happens at academic meetings, which is we just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And we are, academics can be very, very reluctant to make difficult political choices or to make difficult political recommendations. You know, it, it's very easy to say you should do everything, but when you're faced with actual trade-offs, um, um, frankly, we academics don't like to do that, particularly when human lives or human rights are at stake. So we needed sometimes gamey mechanisms to force people to sort of come down to brass tacks and, and make some difficult trade-offs that we could then evaluate. Um, so it, it varied on what we were trying to do. Uh, most, most of these track two things were regular meetings, frankly. Um, we didn't use games for most of them. There were an awful lot of them. Uh, but sometimes we felt that a game would get people to the issue better than having them just sit around the table and talk about it. All right, so we have a great sequence of interesting questions here. Um, first is how do you mitigate bias in these games? Well, they're all biased as hell. <laughs> I, I mean, our, our, our Israelis, you know, uh, our, our Israelis were very, very, very senior Israelis. Uh, and they, they, they were, you know, wanted the peace process to work or they wouldn't have accepted the invitation. But, you know, they had particular views of Israeli interests. Many of our Palestinians uh, were refugees, as well as being academics or officials. I mean, one of them, his, his father had been killed when the IDF had booby-trapped their village in 1948, or what became the IDF again at the time. You know, for them, it was very real. Um, one of the meetings, it wasn't one of the gaming meetings, uh, one of the participants had actually jailed one of the other participants. And in another of one of the meetings, one of the participants had tried to kill one of the other participants in the past. None of that fortunately happened in the meeting. But that is not a problem. We don't want people to be excessively technocratic in what is an existential issue for both Israelis and Palestinians. So what we want to do is use that creatively in the game. Um, 
and, and try to find ways of getting them to highlight their national positions, but also have game mechanisms that will encourage them to find compromises that they will think will work on, on both sides. So bias isn't a problem. It's a, it's an aspect of the problem. It's an aspect of the issue to be managed and even used in, in important ways. And from our point of view, it was important that the participants feel that all ideas were on the table, that we weren't filtering them in some way. And frankly, the way it typically factored into anything diplomatic was the diplomats there would report back to the State Department and who else on, on what happened, and the participants would go home and brief senior officials in their own governments about what they thought was useful from the meeting. So we knew that happened, that we invited those people um, on purpose because we knew that they would go talk to somebody when they went home. Um, but because it was a track two meeting, because it wasn't an official peace process event, because people were usually retired or they were academics, occasionally they were current, um, people could put out ideas without it being an official idea. Um, so there wasn't the liability, because in negotiations you're very reluctant to suggest a compromise, um, you know, why you don't want to take the first step. We're trying to do a setting where people felt a little more comfortable coming up with creative ideas and trial balloons and so forth. But the peace process failed, so perhaps it shouldn't be used as a model for, for uh, eliciting expert opinion. All right, the next question is, I always lived in Madeline Albright's story. Would you mind discussing getting senior officials involved in a very humble manner? Okay, so um, I was doing a game on, on crisis stability in the Gulf for the Atlantic Council a few years ago. And um, I, they were wonderful to work with. I'm not gonna say anything negative here about the Atlantic Council and my colleagues there at the time. Um, but they wanted to run a very classic seminar game. Here's a scenario, go around the table, everyone talks about what they do, go away for lunch, come back, here's the revised scenario, everyone talks. And I said, well, that's, crisis isn't really like that. It's kind of chaotic and there's pressure and there's information trickling in and you're running off and you're meeting. And what I wanted, and, and information flows are uneven and not everyone knows what everyone else knows or they have different information. So I want to separate people and spread them across the building and, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, feed information here and there and have them scurrying around rather like I run the Brainania simulation. And there was some concern at the Atlantic Council, and we're not supposed to mention participants, but since, since Mel and Albright was one of the co-chairs of the session, it's obvious she was there. There was some concern um, that it would be inappropriate to ask senior former officials to scurry around the building like they were university students um, because they liked to sit and have gravitas not run around like it was Model UN and they were, they were 19 again. Um, and there's a bit of back and forth and I, I won that debate and, and uh, Madeline Albright was there and boy, can she scurry. <laughs> I, I mean, she was she was racing up and down those corridors, finding out what was going on in the various rooms. She was there as an observer, as one of the players. Uh, but there was no problem with people um, running around from room to room. When we did the debrief, um, one of the participants complained it was difficult to decide what to do because there was so much information and so much partial information and that they didn't like that. But then one of the other participants said, well, I was in you know, the Pentagon doing ops stuff when the USS Vincennes shot down the Iranian Airbus and nothing we were told for the first 24 hours turned out to be entirely true. This was a very similar kind of scenario. He said, no, that's, that's what it's like. I mean, you, you, know, you don't have clean, perfect information in the middle of a rapidly evolving, potentially military crisis in the Gulf or, or elsewhere. But I do think you can get participants. You have to watch. I mean, you have to know your participants. And if you don't know them, you have to err on the side of caution. Um, but I do think that seniors will actually can really get into the spirit of things and, and you can get them running around the room. You can get refugees who are in their own right, community leaders or heads of think tanks or professors to put up with not having a room and having to sit on deck chairs outside smoking while everyone else is in a lovely mahogany paneled library room in a, in a stately home. I do think you can do that, but you've always got to know who, know who your participants are. So related to that, I'm actually going to combine, see if I can combine two questions here. Um, so with the LARP mechanics, kind of like what you're talking about there with the scurrying or the, um, the, the hour uh, laying on the ground uh, to simulate death, um, are there specific mechanics or in the development of mechanics recommendations you would make um, for usage in a professional environment with a, a post-college crowd 
uh, to a certain extent to what you were just discussing with uh, Secretary Albright? You know, it, it, it depends who they are. And again, I'll say that the great thing about university students is they're game for almost everything. I, I find that people will, will um, accept a lot if you explain to them that, that you're not, um, uh, you're, you're not trying to humiliate them. I mean, there's an actual game reason why you're doing what they, what they're doing, but you know, there are certainly settings where I wouldn't take the risk and I would do something very traditional and conventional uh, in case someone got upset. Um, so I don't want you to think that all my games involve someone lying on the floor dying. <laughs> Sometimes they're very sedate affairs um, in which, which everyone can show the appropriate amount of, of, of gravitas. I will say that I think if you can get players into the game, if you can immerse them in the game narrative, if it starts to feel real, if they start to feel some real attachment to their, to their actor and to their actor, goal, you get a far better game product than if it seems all very artificial and not real and what have you. And many of the things I'm gaming, you're dealing with time pressures, imperfect information, um, silos, uh, semi-cooperative relationships in which messiness is desirable. But messiness is not always desirable. There are games in which you don't want messiness because it's very hard to see what is going on and you need to see what is going on. But often the games I'm running, messiness is, is particularly the student games, is part of the process. You want them to understand that messiness because either if they're gonna study it or if they're gonna to wanna to do it, um, they, they need to understand what the complexity is. I mean, anyone who's worked in government will know policy processes are really messy but when you get all your ducks in a row, when you've talked to the right people, when you've convened the right meetings in the right way and you've moved information in the right place and you've outmaneuvered your opponents and you've got an idea from idea to policy, it's a great feeling. It's you know, navigating through the jungle and finally arriving where you're supposed to be. Uh, so a lot of my games, I, I'm not trying to add in a fog and friction to use Klaus Fritzian type terms. Uh, for the fun of it, it's because I want people to understand that and know how to deal with it and know how to work with it in order to get where they want to go. Uh, next, we have, uh, can you elaborate on how you created the model of these games, like how war games typically create conflict models as the underlying function of the game system? So it entirely depends on, on, on which one we're talking about. So in the Middle East peace process ones, we were dealing with the real world. I mean, I didn't need to invent a game model because all the participants were or had been involved in the peace process or were experts in it. And so the real life world was our model. We were just in the business of moving information around. And, and, and players had internalized their view of what would work politically, what was acceptable to their governments, um, et cetera, et cetera, because in many cases that had been their, their professional thing. We didn't really have to adjudicate much. We were just really interested in looking at negotiating behavior and issues and so on and so forth. There wasn't, in that game, there's not really much in the way of adjudication. Um, occasionally we would have, you know, protests or bad press coverage or what have you, but I don't think anyone, I, mean, I think it was all fairly obvious what we do. In Aftershock, on the other hand, because it's a rigid game, there's a lot of modeling. You had to decide what was important, what things did you want to highlight, coordination, logistics planning, uh, the cluster system in the UN, uh, the trade-off between coordinating versus doing in the field, uh, the trade-off between short-term aid versus long-term development, uh, some of the security things. So in that case, there's a, a game model with variables and formalized relationships between them that are baked into the, into the rules. In Brynania, um, some of it is in my head, and Brian Eddy very much is sort of everything I teach in the course put into one country. So the reason I use a fictional country is I can put in the dynamics we've talked about in class into the same country, with the exception of the, the resource issues and the humanitarian issues, which are algorithm based. Um, and those are good enough fits. In other words, players have to make realistic type decisions with more or less realistic type outcomes, but I don't really care if my casualty model is off plus or minus 50% because for instructional purposes, it's not that important. It's more important that it's more or less the right magnitude and students can during the game or afterwards understand why the choices they made led to better or worse humanitarian outcomes. The next question in the series is, how about climate change simulations? Have you done any? 
I, I, I've actually been in email chains with other people who, who've designed and run or were designing and running uh, climate change uh, simulations. You can absolutely do it. Um, a lot will depend on who your participants are. If they're all climate change experts, you don't have to, you, you have to work less hard to make the game engaging because it's their life's work and they're pre-engaged. I mean, they find it fascinating. They find it interesting. If you are doing it as a public event and one of the email chains I was in was for a public event, you've got to make sure people, it's not so mechanistic um, and dull and technical that people get bored after playing. You've, you've got to catch their interest. There have to be enough interesting choices often enough that they're not bored silly. So um, you do have to think who is your audience and, and what are they predisposed to do. But in issues of you know short-term gain versus long-term consequences, issues of international cooperation, even sectoral issues of how you allocate resources, how you, right now we're dealing with the declining carbon sector uh, in the US, but particularly in Canada, both in Alberta and Newfoundland. You know, how do you deal with that? Where do you allocate funds? Uh, how do you see the transformation of those industries? Um, those are all, all things that you can do. So climate change absolutely could be, could be gamed and has been gamed. All right, looks like our last question here is going back to those real world LARP mechanics. Uh, how, does, how do you get people to shake off the awkwardness and get invested in the game? And with that in mind, the icebreaker that you might use or the mechanic you might use, uh, how is that different for games that are played in person versus remotely or online? Well, I mean, I will say about the LARP aspect, um, I, I, it gets less LARPy the more serious my audience is. And too much LARP can be a bad thing. I mean, if, it's, if people are being too silly or they might end up doing stuff that breaks the game or, or pushes it off in, in, in weird ways, um, Generally, uh, I mean, for the, the mega games, there's actually a guidance on what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. You know, you can dress up like this, but no firearms, uh, simulated firearms being Canada. Uh, in Brynania, um, I talk to people. Most of the, I'd say that 99.9% .9 of my students know where the sweet spot is. I've, the number of students who I think have gone overboard is two in 18 runs with up to 100 participants, 120 participants per time. So most of the time, they, they're pretty good at judging what works and what, uh, what doesn't work. Um, in, in both the Mega Games and, and, and uh, Brynania, they've been run for several years. So you have a lot of repeat players. So people do kind of know, at least some people know what to, what to expect. Or they've, in Brynania, they haven't played it before, but they've, their roommates have played it. Or, in one particular case, their their daughter had played it, and and then the mother went back to school. Um, so you know, there's a there's a bit of an oral tradition at McGill about about Brynania, um, and and people who've been in Brynania, even if they were in different years when they meet in the real world, now often tell war stories, which is a kind of cool thing. Excellent. Well, it uh, looks like that is the last question in the series. So feel free to proceed. Okay, so uh, I'm going to end up with something that's particularly germane, which is which is pandemic uh, preparedness. Um, clearly, my preparedness is not optimal because you'll, you'll see on the next slide there's an S missing in preparedness, but never mind. Um, it so happens that the last year could not have prepared me better for COVID-19. Um, I've run, a, or last year and a half, I've run a, a couple of zombie mega games. I run a peace building game that's got a lot of emergency management in it. I ran a bunch of pandemic preparedness games for the, the federal government. Um, and I was expert advisor to a software company, which was developing an entertainment game around post-apocalyptic survival, in which I was literally listed as a subject matter expert in post-apocalyptic societies, which was perhaps my coolest job description ever. Um, so I've done just coincidentally a bunch of things that touch on this. I haven't run, you know, coronavirus or flu pandemic simulations, which a bunch of people have run, but I have run a bunch of stuff that that, that cross cuts the situation we're in right now. So ignore the missing S in preparedness there. And I want to talk about a series of analytical games that were run in January, February with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So the, the Canadian Ministry of Agriculture on pandemic preparedness. This was not about coronavirus. This was about African swine fever. African swine fever is a lot worse than coronavirus if you're a pig 
it, it, it is uh, its, it's um, uh, reproduction rate, its infectiousness is about three to four times higher than, than uh, COVID-19, and the fatality rate is in excess of 95%. Um, and last year, it, one quarter of the world's pigs may have died from culling or otherwise as a consequence of African swine fever. It's a really scary thing if you, if you work in agriculture. And they had been preparing for it for years. It's, it's uh, endemic in, in some places in the world right now. We don't have it in North America yet. Um, and they wanted to just come at the problem from a different angle. So they have dozens of staff working on these issues who are you know, virologists or epidemiologists or agricultural economists or food safety inspectors, but they wanted to run some games as well. Now, I will say that this is the best client I've ever worked with. Um, ironically, far better than any of the militaries they've ever worked with. That's not to, to cast a slur on my friends in the military who I love working with, but they very much knew what they wanted the game for, how they were going to use it. And instead of me running a game for them, which I did do after I ran the first game for them, they ran a whole stack of games by themselves without me even there, uh, which is the best possible thing. They acquired an ongoing ability to, to run and tweak games to explore issues. Approach here was a matrix game. Um, that is to say, there were virtually no pre-written rules. We had people playing the various stakeholders and we had a scenario and in your turn, you just say what you want to do. And then we have a discussion of how feasible it is, how likely it is to achieve the desired objective. Then we aggregate uh, from the crowd, we crowdsource probabilities of success. Uh, then we roll a pair of percentage dice and depending on the die roll, it succeeds or it fails or it succeeds a lot or it fails a lot and then we go on to the, the next move. That's a matrix game, super easy, but also very good for dealing with complex issues with a lot of ramifications and multi-sided stakeholders, which is why we did it. A lot of negotiation, coordination. We did model bureaucratic capacity to some extent. So if you were the government, you couldn't do everything, but that was about the only additional mechanism added into the, into the game. Very strong support from senior uh, leaders. And in fact, just cut off on the left, a woman with her arms crossed is the uh, associate deputy minister. So the number two bureaucrat in Agriculture Canada uh, playing as a pork farmer. And boy, did she get into it because she got furious with her own department that they were being inadequately supportive of pork farmers. Uh, we've since run one game on, on food supply chain issues uh, during COVID-19. I don't think it ran as well as the African swine fever game because African swine fever is a very crisis game. Um, the costs, obviously, they're not COVID-19 scale costs, but they're multi-billion dollar costs. And there are huge problems. There are 75,000 hogs a week that cross from Manitoba alone into the United States. Um, a lot of those meat packing plants that are having COVID-19 problems in the U.S. Midwest, they're, they're pork at least is coming from Canada. And if the border closes, which it instantly does the moment you have a single African swine fever case in the United States or Canada, you have 75,000 pigs a week piling up at the border. And they do pile up at the border because you can't keep them in the barn because pigs grow very quickly and they're packed in very tightly and you literally have to move pigs out each week or you have to cull them. And culling millions and millions of pigs, thousands of pigs you can do, millions of pigs is really, really difficult. Um, so we ran this, these series of games. Um, as I said, great buy-in from senior leader. The deputy minister, too, uh, was outstanding. Terrific insight. Uh, one of the, uh, the person who now runs them at, at um, uh, AAFC said they haven't yet run a game that didn't generate new and important insights into their preparedness. So that was just terrific. In many cases, it was experts. Um, I remember one game where um, uh, our food inspection agency clamped a, a uh, sorry, a, a um, quarantine around a farm. And then we had to vote on how successful the quarantine would be. And the food inspection agency rated it as only 70% successful. There was a 30% chance it would fail. And everyone kind of looked on in horror. And they said, yeah, well, we have complete control over all agricultural goods going in and out of a farm, but we can't stop people from going in and out. So if the the, the farm's teenager wants to drive his ATV through a muddy field to the farm next door to visit his girlfriend. We have no legal capacity to stop him driving, and this stuff survives for weeks in mud. So, you know, there's a very good chance the pathogen won't be contained in any single quarantine. Uh, and a lot of people in the room, their jaws drop because they were, say, economists who'd assume that when you quarantine the farm, 
the farm was quarantined. So a lot of really interesting insight came out of that game um, and just a joy to, 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 to participate with them because they understood the strength and weakness of the game. They didn't put too much weight on it. 99% of their work is not games based. They just wanted to exercise some different muscles, do some intellectual cross training, take what they knew and their preparedness and sort of test it in a different way in a game that only takes two and a half hours, three hours to play, which is easy to run, which doesn't have complex rules, which they could cycle over and over again with different people with different expertise, different levels of seniority, um, and just use it as another input into the policy process. And that was exactly the right way to take it. They didn't put too much emphasis on the game, but they saw it as a methodological tool amongst the many other methodological tools they have to develop policy on, on this issue. It also means whenever I see news on on pork production and, and slaughtering plants. I'm thinking I know where they are because they're all marked on that big giant map there um, that you see in, in front of you. So in summary, um, that's what we've just talked about. A uh, whole series of non-kinetic games, uh, educational, analytical, or for fun, with players running from four to over 100, with game time running from a few hours to an entire week. Uh, manual technologies, uh, for the most part, although Brian e has a lot of digital support to it as well. Some of them turn-based, some of them continuous moves, uh, adjudication all over the place. So as you can see, get back to my original point, there is no single way to design a non-kinetic game. You need to think about what is the problem you're trying to solve and how will the game get you there and how are you going to incorporate a model the issue you're, you're exploring. Um, there is, I think, perhaps some things to think about and how do you get the right amount of semi-cooperative play because almost all of these are, are semi-cooperative games. They're not classically adversarial games. They're not classically uh, uh, cooperative games. And on that note, um, I'll, uh, I'll throw it open for, for, uh, for questions. Uh, the, the picture in the middle, I will have you know, is the Canadian government developing a a vaccine for the virus, unfortunately, not uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19, but the zombie virus. But they are very proudly in a bunker under CARP, Ontario, um, announcing that they've got a, a, a new vaccine. All right, awesome. so again, if anybody has any questions for Rex, please uh, put those into the chat and I'll be happy to share them. So first question here, is with less rigid games, how important is it to have a map or physical virtual object that tracks what is going on? Um, it can be very, I mean, visual objects are gonna cue the player's attention. If the players need to be thinking about something or if geography or the level of a variable is very important to gameplay, you need to have it there. So in the uh, African Swine Fever game, there is a map of Canada, and on that can on that map, there is a sticker for every you know each sticker represents fifty thousand hogs, and so the entire sort of heat map density of hog production in Canada is on there, and every significant slaughterhouse in the country is on there as well, and there are tokens to show you how many hogs are moving per week across the border with the U.S. from that province or from that province into another province. And there are indicators which you can't see. They're up on easels showing what's the current price of pork, uh, how solvent are farmers, how solvent are processors, what's the level of political support for the government, you know, what's, what's public opinion. We need something to visually remind players of that and so they can consult it in the game. You have to be careful with um, components because when you have components, players will focus on the components. So one of the things we've noticed with matrix games on issues that are, are Paul Mill is that when you put military counters on people, particularly military personnel, but a lot of people, gamers too, start playing the military side of the game. And you sometimes have to make sure you have indicators of civilians or refugees or economic damage or what have you, because if you just stick the military units on, everyone starts playing it as if it was a, you know, a hex board game and they're, they're, they're going super kinetic. So the, the game display is part of that psychological manipulation of the players. It's cueing them about what to think about. And so that can be positive if you want them to think about things. It can also be the way they track things they need to know to play the game. But you have to be aware of how it will, how it will influence their play. Because you can distort gameplay by the way in which you display information and the information you display. Next question is, can you speak to your experience gaming cyber operations? 
I, I don't, I haven't gained cyber operations. I, I, I you know, I, I've seen cyber operations gained. Um, it depends on what you want to do. Um, if you're gaming the effect of cyber operations on kinetic combat, frankly, it's just a modifier to combat effectiveness. If your headquarters is taken out because your comms are jammed and your computers are jammed, or if your headquarters is taken out by a Russian multiple rocket launcher, it's pretty much the same effect. So I think in a lot of kinetic games, you don't have to model the cyber, you just have to mod model the effect on operations of the cyber as you model other things. If you are modeling actual cyber vulnerabilities, if you're modeling defenses, if you're modeling uh, response to a cyber crisis, then you need more of the cyber in. So how much cyber you need in a game about cyber kind of depends on what the currency of the game is. Um, if, it's, if it's combat operations, you just need some model of how badly things are hurt. Uh, if, it's, if it's the actual network architecture or vulnerable nodes or policy decisions, then you might need more attention to, uh, uh, to networks. The next question is, are there any games like Rhinania that allow for fully online participation? In other words, the game board is electronic or online instead of physical. There is a game called Statecraft, uh, which is used in, in a fair number of introductory international relations courses, which is a browser-based online game, uh, fictional environment, uh, interstate politics, uh, very digital game-like. You know, you're, you're investing in capabilities that give you more capabilities downstream. You're communicating by, you know, chat software that is built into the game. Um, so that, that is entirely... Um, uh, and it's fairly rigid in the sense that the, the variable relationships aren't determined by the, by the white cell, they're determined by the, the programming. So that's there. Um, key is to use it well. There's some research that shows it doesn't work. There's some research, more research that shows it works quite well. When it doesn't work, it's because I think the instructor's not used it properly, not because it doesn't work. It's not a game I would use because I think that it, it models interstate behavior in a excessively realist way for those of you who know your IR theory, uh, but it's a perfectly good game. You can also, there's uh, electronic supports for seminar type games. Um, so, you know, the Icons Project at the University of Maryland has browser-based support. So you could run a Brynania type game through their software. They have a bunch of scenarios that you can, you can purchase. They also custom do scenarios often for, for government clients. I've taken part in some of those games. That works quite well. Essentially, it um, allows players to communicate, allows you to share briefing material, allows you to monitor their internal communications. Works best, as I say, in seminar type games. If you're at a university, you can often do the same with your course support software. So I teach a, a game design course. One of the games this term was a Chinese foreign policy simulation that my students were designing for one of my colleagues. That is entirely implemented in my courses, which is our course support software like Blackboard or the others that are out there. They did a brilliant job of leveraging the actual quite impressive capabilities of the university's um, course support software, which 95% of faculty never use and we don't know is there. And same thing, you know, they can control the information flows they can monitor the chat through separate discussion groups. Uh, you can submit material to the instructor online. You, the in instructor can, inter can inject material via the course support software. So there's both digital multiplayer IR games, one at least, Statecraft, and there's a couple of ways you can platform seminar type, negotiation type games that are wholly digital. So are there any examples of games that would simulate a scenario similar to what has unfolded in the past few years in Ukraine or Syria? In other words, hybrid warfare scenario between the kinetic and non-kinetic? Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms, sorry, in terms of any game or in terms of digital games? Any games. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I last year I had a, a Ukraine game as one of the class projects. Uh, a couple of years before that, I had a, a really outstanding Syria game as one of the one of the class projects. Uh, Brian Train has a Ukraine game, uh, which is very much hybrid warfare. Um, so, you know, th those things are certainly possible to do. One of the things you deal with non-kinetic games is often the cause and effect is contested. That is to say, how much propaganda or information operations produces what change in public opinion with what political consequences 
Well, that's an imperfect art. I mean, it's not like we, you, you can model it, but it's not like we absolutely agree on, on these things. Um, I used to, when I occasionally worked as an intelligence analyst um, on Middle East stuff, I used to ask my Five Eyes and European colleagues uh, why violence had declined in, in Iraq uh, after the surge. Um, and there was absolutely no agreement amongst the best Middle East analysts in the Western world as to whether it was the surge, whether it was the Anbar Awakening outreach, whether it was the fact that the uh, bombing of the Alaska Ray Mosque had caused uh, Shiite militia actors to enter the fight in a much bigger way and frighten Sunnis into a different political position, whether it was changes in US counterinsurgency doctrine. And these are people who full time do nothing else than analyze Iraq or, or conflict in the Middle East more broadly, depending on the country. So one of the problems here is it's not like we're all agreed. On the other hand, if you're firing a, a heat round at you know, the front of a Tiger One, um, you know, and we know the thickness, um, or, you know, we, we, have, we have pretty good data on, you know, operations research data on, on how effective those weapon systems are. When we get to political and social stuff, you know, we have theories and some of them have greater consensus or another, but we don't have mathematical formulas that are absolutely solid and we have to be aware of that. Earlier you mentioned, uh, you, you discussed determining whether a game is appropriate for finding an answer to the question you're trying to answer. Do you have any basic criteria you use to term, determine that? Um, I, I think those criteria are probably internalized. The first one is how long it's going to take, how complicated it is to do, whether you can get the people and what the risk is of it going wrong. Um, because that can be a problem too. Uh, one reason you might not want to do a game or you might not want to do an innovative game is it's, is it's, uh, is it's risky. I think the reason that seminar games rule in Washington, both in, 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 in DOD and in the think tank world is they're super safe. They're, everyone, they're a bit like seminars, so everyone's comfortable with them. So I, I think those are the first things. How long have you got? Who do you need? Uh, where do you got to hold on? Those material things are often the first thing I go to. And you know, is it actually practical to run a game? Um, then you start probing, you know, what is the actual question you want? answered and will a game get you there uh, and will a particular game get you there because it might be that a game will get you there but not the game that you're willing or able to run and that the game you're willing and able to run won't get you there and, and there's way too many games run which essentially are validating a predetermined conclusion and so it's what i call game washing you know you, you know what you want to say and you have a game which surprise surprise comes to that conclusion um, uh, you know, some years back, the U.S. oil industry ran a high-profile game in Washington in which, surprise, surprise, the finding of the game was you needed to offshore drill more and you needed to frack more um, and, and so forth, and you needed to invest in U.S. energy capabilities. Surprise, surprise, I'm really shocked that that was the conclusion of the game. Um, so sometimes I also say to people, you don't want a game, you actually just want someone to say you're right. It's, I'm not terribly interested in, in, in doing that. Um, but often it's a complexity issue of whether it would be just better to have a meeting. Um, in the gaming community, we, uh, we use the term bog sat, a bunch of guys and gals sitting at a table in a very pejorative way to talk about games that aren't really games, they're just meetings. But I have to say that some of the most intellectually stimulating things they've ever been to are well-run meetings. So meetings are not bad if you know how to run the meeting, if you use interesting facilitation techniques to really push people. Um, uh, so, you know, is, is, is it worth, on the other hand, a game might be super engaging, it might get people to think out of the box, it might be an opportunity to get people to, from different backgrounds into the same room. Um, it might be, this is a might, it might be an opportunity to break down hierarchy. Uh, there can be times when no one is willing to contradict the most senior person in the game, and that's a problem. That is a bigger problem in the military than it is in, in civilian ministries. Uh, but it can be a problem. On the other hand, you have cases, both the, the UNRWA game and the Agriculture Canada games, the seniors made it very clear uh, that they wanted ideas from everyone. And, and you know, they, they, they wanted people to disagree. They wanted people to say our, our response is broken or we're not prepared. A mechanism I used in the UN game is we had three teams. Two of them were expert teams trying to come up with the policy solution. Uh, former diplomats, former UN personnel, academics who spent their life working on, on Middle East peace process or refugee or conflict issues. The third team was graduate students. 
And because the head of the agency was going to choose the best course of action at the end of the game, there was every risk that the best course of action would come from the graduate students, thus humiliating the experts who had 20, 30 years expertise in the field each. Um, and I put that mechanism in there in order to make my experts work because they were all absolutely terrified of being beaten by students. Um, so that worked really well. The students did quite well, they came second. So, so they actually beat one of the expert teams that had, I think I calculated 300 years of expertise on the topic, but the agency actually thought the student brief was slightly better than theirs. Um, but you want that in that case, you know, that was a senior who wanted it, who was very clear that he wanted everyone to be frank and honest. And if they broke things, that was a good game. If they said this won't work or here's a problem, that was a good game. Next is can you discuss some of your experience and insights in gaming non-kinetic effects in military war games, such as the movements of displaced persons, economics, morale, et cetera? Well, the first thing, um, um, one thing I will say to, at the beginning is you need to make sure that you're, if you have someone playing civilian or humanitarian actors, that there's someone who understands how civilians behave or humanitarian actors, because it is not just enough to get the first lieutenant who didn't move fast enough to be the aid agencies if they don't think like an aid agency. Uh, person. Um, I have another talk, which I'm not going to give now, about culture and wargaming, in which my finding is that natural, national cultures make a bit less difference than people think, and professional cultures make an enormous difference to how people play games. Um, there is, for example, a whole robust body of literature that show economists don't play games like other people. They, they utility maximize <laughs> because they're economists, um, and they don't behave like the rest of us, uh, which is really interesting. Um, so first off, make sure that if you have have that represented by a player that that player is in the appropriate mindset. Um, don't just make it window dressing. Um, if you can, and Matt Stevens is the person to talk to who's in on this call at, at Lessons uh, Learn Simulation and Training. Um, he does games in which people are, you know, playing refugees and they're trying to survive. And he, he has a great presentation, which he gave at Connections North uh, uh, this year on making sure that your, you know, your civilian actors are behaving like civilian actors and are, are facing the kinds of concerns that they have, which may be completely different concerns. You also need to think about what the consequences are to military operations of damage to critical infrastructure, to roads being clogged with refugees, to people begging food, to uh, uh, you know, theft and pilfering of, of, of supplies, um, because those things are there. I, I was involved in, uh, in a tiny, tiny way in work on autonomous resupply systems, um, and I know of one game, I wasn't involved in it, in which they were gaming out the effect of autonomous resupply systems, except for once the autonomous resupply system was by itself, the civilian, hungry civilians in the villages would just dig a big pit and catch it and then take all the food off of it because it had no soldiers guarding it and they were hungry. Um, so, you know, you need, you need your civilians to not be an afterthought. And if they are an important part of the terrain, they either need to be a sophisticated part of the game model or they need to be played by one or more actors so that they've got their, their actual interests um, realistically played and they're not just part of the terrain like the hills. There's the hills and there's some refugees and that's that. What if anything have you found to be a critical flaw in a game? As in, are there certain red flags that tell an expert like yourself that this is a terrible game? And following up on that, uh, can you discuss examples of games going wrong? Uh, well, I like to think none of my games went wrong, but I'm sure some of them have. Um, a, a red flag, okay, hierarchy is a big problem. If, if people aren't prepared to play their roles and think freely, then, then you're shooting yourself in the foot intellectually. That's a big problem. Games in which the sponsor has already decided what the outcome will be um, are a big problem. And, and Stephen Downs Martin is the person to go on this because Stephen's research agenda for the past few years has been how to, how to ruin games, <laughs> how to distort games, how to, how to, how to run a game and, and then come up with a completely different conclusion. The analytical part after a game can be a weak link. We ran an experiment at Connections UK a few years ago in which we had three teams write an analysis report on the same game. It was a, it was a big mega game. Um, and the analysis reports had substantially different findings, even though those teams were all observing the same game and had access to exactly the same data. So that can be a weak link. Um, so the assumption that you've run the game and the analysis is the easy part, or it has an obvious conclusion, I think that's problematic. And on the educational side, the notion that a game teaches itself, it doesn't. 
People can learn all kinds of wrong things from a game. They might mistake a game artifact, an artificiality of the game for something real. So doing debriefing is really important and learning from your players is really important because often you don't understand how the game was broken until players told you why they did the things they did in the game or how the game looked for, to them because a game looks very different as, as a player than it does as a... Uh, as an umpire or the white cell or the the, the, the game designer. Um, I've had cases in which I'd want to go back and tweak the model, wasn't happy with the model after the game. I've had uh, problems where IT infrastructure didn't work as delivered. And so I reflexively now always have a backup for what happens if the Wi-Fi fails, <laughs> what happens if the computers don't work, what happens if they don't talk to each other the way they're supposed to, what have you. I mean, always, if you're depending on, technology is amazing, I love it, but always make sure you have a backup for if it doesn't work on the day. Um, I've had players walk out of games um, because they, they didn't like aspects of them. Um, uh, I had a, a, someone storm out of a game because they, they said that uh, uh, it, was, it was a silly, ridiculous playground thing to be doing. Um, had they waited, we were doing introductions, they would have discovered the person they were sitting next to was a former deputy national security advisor who clearly thought the game was worthwhile. But um, so I've had participants who haven't liked the game. I've had participants who don't like the game the way the game went um, because they have different views on it and that's being problematic. Um, so, you know, I've had participants not show up because of who else is showing up. If you're dealing with an active conflict environment um, in which one side has tried to kill the other side at one point, there can be enormous sensitivities over that. You have to, you have to tiptoe around. Um, it can be very hard to get Palestinians to, to do seminar activities, let alone games with Israelis, not because they don't want to deal with Israelis, but because they feel they have to go to endless seminars and they're still under occupation and they're kind of getting annoyed about it. Um, so there's a big backlash in Palestinian society about normalizing relationships when the occupation continues. So that's, that's probably the biggest sensitivity I've had to deal with. I've had to deal with sensitivities over whether something is official or not official um, and often find a gray zone where something is official enough that the officials will come, but unofficial enough that we have plausible deniability in the findings, um, because there's nothing worse than an official game that has a conclusion that ends up being reported in the press as if that was what the desired outcome was. I mean, ask Bill Gates about this right now. I mean, Bill Gates um, supported and participated, supported um, pandemic simulations. And right now you will find YouTube videos with millions of hits that those simulations showed that Bill Gates planned the coronavirus pandemic so that he could insert microchips in us all, right? So you know, here's a man who's, who plans to give away 90% of all of his assets for humanitarian purposes, who's reviled, in, in some circles right now um, uh, because he ran a simulation and people confuse the simulation with the fact that we subsequently had a coronavirus pandemic. Um, so next, uh, and this uh, you touched on a little bit, but uh, do you have any words of wisdom uh, on gaming the non-kinetic aspects of terrorism and counter-extremism? Uh, or or counter-terrorism, yeah, counter uh, like radicalization, the effects, non-effects of countering violent extremism, yeah. Um, I, I, first of all, think what you're trying to do. And, and secondly, um, terrorism studies is a very fraught field. It has some absolutely outstanding work and it has some of the worst work in the social sciences. Okay, and I, as someone who works on political violence, I, I feel comfortable saying that. You need to make sure that you have a suitably nuanced and dynamic view of what drives armed insurgents, how they self-conceptualize, what the dynamics of radicalization are, and you don't have a very cartoonish view of, of who these people uh, are. Now, clearly there are uh, violent extremists who are kooky, mental health issues, who are just wild, but some of them are pretty thoughtful and rational and have a particular worldview um, in which violence is an answer. Uh, but then my grandfather was a resistance organizer. I mean, they used to pop people off too in, in the occupied Netherlands. Um, you know, I think you need to fairly capture the dynamics of radicalization or recruitment or, or, or violent operations and so forth. Um, and I think that sometimes it's, it's a very cartoonish 
uh, view of those actors and, and not a terribly sophisticated one. So next is, uh, what are the differences between how conventional marketers would run industry run or civilian oriented games versus InfoOps or PSYOP games run by the IC? Um, well, I, I've never participated in a PSYOPs game run by the IC, although I've worked in the, in the IC. In fact, um, virtually no game. I mean, gaming activity in the IC is, is, is somewhat limited depending on which part of the, the IC you're in. There's often other analytical techniques that are used because they're easier to run. Um, the problem, the real problem with information operations games or political influence games or even political campaigning games, doesn't have to be an information operation, it could be a, a presidential campaign, is um, our imperfect knowledge of how messages and narratives will affect behavior um, and the ways in which um, those narratives take on a life of their, a life of their own once, they, uh, you know, once they're said. Um, you know, so, so you can say something which sounds very, obviously the, the British government put a lot of thought into its new slogan for the next phase of the lockdown in the UK. And it's clearly backfired despite presumably hundreds of people thinking about that slogan before it was released. So, you know, you, you can, th this is the problem. And this is probably why you might want to run, if you have an area where there's a great deal of uncertainty about effects, then you may want to run a lot of games because that way you can explore more of the problem space with more interpretations and more possibilities than if you run a single large sophisticated game around something in which the relationship is very uncertain. Um, so there is a trade-off between running the one big game, which is often the way it gets done in government, um, versus running a lot of smaller games, which have perhaps lower fidelity um, because they're smaller and faster, but you can run them over and over and over again and see if patterns develop or if stuff comes up in one game that didn't come up in another game and then you can ask why did it? Is it we hadn't thought of it before or is it a problem with the game? Um, again, I'm gonna praise my colleagues at Agriculture Canada who keep running games over and over and over again in order to find out whether the same issue comes up with different participants or whether different issues come up and some of those are just game artifacts, but some of those are probably actual findings. So. Um, the tendency is to make a professional game a big production, like a theater production, but then your, your, your run is one, your end is one. Um, and so it's not, I'm not saying it's not useful, but there are times when running more quick and dirty games may be more useful. All right, I would just quickly say, uh, we'll do last call for questions here. We currently have two left, so we can maybe squeeze in one or two others. Uh, first, Rex, do you know of any pandemic war games out there which can be deliberately plagiarized for supranational co coordinative or semi-cooperative issues, uh, in parentheses, an example, Focus Europe? Yeah, no, I, I'm not sure I'd go out for a model. I, I would, um, you first got to decide, you know, what is your level of analysis? Who are your players representing? Are they national governments? Are they public health agencies? What are the issues they're interacting with? And I would just des design a... Uh, 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 a negotiation game. Uh, Natasha Gill has a very good book, um, a booklet out, you can find out on the internet on, it's called the Inside the Box, Outside the Box, something to do with boxes, on designing negotiation games. I mean, a lot of that is a negotiation game. You may want to think what injects or resources you need so that players don't excessively cooperative, cooperate or give away the store. Uh, but that's probably, you can run that as a sort of continuous turn seminar game or is a turn-based seminar game or um, a very discussion-based game. Um, and I, so I don't think you need a sophisticated game model. The kind of approach we use for the, the big negotiation simulation on the, the refugee issue and the peace process in which players were given a brief and they were set off to negotiate, but there were different players had slightly different agendas and you had sub players and we inserted uh, in, injects and we, we uh, we generated news based on what was happening and we had actual reporters running around that game who were actual reporters who, had a, who covered the Middle East beat, playing themselves, reporting on the simulation and distributing it electronically in real time. So you had leaks and so on and so forth. That works fine. That's actually not very complicated. And, and it's not far off what some of the bigger and more sophisticated student run model UNs are doing these days with, with crisis games. So we'll anyway, so I'll, I'll just okay. make one point here. We do not mind the wisdom of Model UN. Um, 
a lot of people participated in it. Um, the one at McGill is a thousand participants in three days. Very few of us have run games that size. Um, so a thousand participants from all over the world. So, you know, there's a lot of, though they're excessively debate focused, but there's, there's a, a lot of expertise in how they get people to talk about an issue. So if you want to see how contending agendas would work out, a modified sort of model UN-ish thing, but with some resource constraints and injects and sub-players pulling the players in different directions would be the way I'd probably go. All right, so our final question here. Can you talk about your research process for writing the game, picking out what information is useful for rules slash modeling and what is chaff? You know, I, I'd like to think that it's a, 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 a super structured, um, process of, of thoughtfully going through it in a, in a common way. Uh, half my games consist of someone giving me a call and saying, would you like to do this? And then it being a very short time scale. And I have, you know, game, I have a, a day job as well. Um, and then desperately trying to get it done in time. Um, usually is a brainstorming session to begin with. Uh, I have some initial ideas and how I think a game will work, but we, we bat it around, maybe it doesn't work, uh, make lists of things that need to be in the game, that list will get too long, start paring it down, uh, play test the sub games. Ideally, you wanna play test the game, but I'll be perfectly frank, sometimes you can't do that. If you can't play test the game, you need to make sure you've built in flexibility to modify the game on the fly, if it's not working out quite the way you think that it is. Um, uh, the extent to which I document stuff depends on on the game. I'd, I'd like to think I'm systematic, but sometimes it's 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 a fairly loose process. And I must say, some of the better game designs have been fairly loose processes with sort of email chains and drafts going forward. Um, collaborative software, posting things on you know Google Docs can be super handy so that everyone can see everything, can comment everything. So you've got the you can track changes, you can track comments. And, and so on and so forth. But um, I'd like to have a more, a, a more structured way of doing it, but, but life frequently interrupts and it's, it's just trying to make time around all the things I have to do to get my paycheck. Rex, we actually got one last question here that I think would be great to wrap up with. What's the most surprising thing you personally have learned from designing and running these various games? What is the most surprising thing I've, um, Okay, I have to say it was probably in the peace process game, um, understanding the extent to which the negotiations, which had been dominated by diplomats, lawyers, political advisors, and to some extent the military, had failed to anticipate that some of the stuff they were at risk of agreeing to, so some of the stuff that was in drafts, for example, of negotiating language, uh, would not work in real life because it was outside their area of expertise regarding refugees, which was what I was working on, uh, because there were not people with that expertise in the room in that role. And so it was an excessively legalistic approach. And I think that not only was that, I mean, I suspected that, that's why we ran the conference, but when people who've been doing negotiations for years say, oh, that never occurred to me. And you're thinking, yeah, but you're the person who's actually doing the negotiations. I mean, if peace breaks out next year, you're in large part responsible for it. Um, that was striking. And, and often when I would go to brief at State Department or elsewhere, um, how stubborn some of the misconceptions were which the game had revealed. You know, the, the game highlighted that, that some of the assumptions that people had about people's behavior were based in their own stereotypes. Uh, not in the way those people actually behave. So interestingly in games, um, issues of social justice and not feeling exploited and transitional justice, um, those were really important to people and, and material resources did not offset them. Now there's some social science research that quite a bit of it that also shows that, but I was struck by how many diplomats thought if you just threw money at the problem, people would be okay with the compromise. And the games highlighted that they clearly weren't. Now the games were games, they weren't real life, but I think that also is buttressed by a lot of the social science research on this lately too. So I think there were some really interesting findings about the way a very thoughtful set of peace negotiations with a lot of really brilliant people involved can just simply because of their backgrounds and their perspectives 
miss important aspects of what's going on. And to their credit, um, when they heard that, there was a adjustment in behaviors. Now, the peace process didn't work out. We don't really have a peace process right now, notwithstanding the one that the United States has announced. So that's all old stuff. But that was, I think, quite revealing. And I think one of the reasons why there was a lot of interest in doing follow-up activities off of that one game. All right, well, with that, um, on behalf of the Georgetown University War Gaming Society, uh, I personally like to thank Rex for this extremely informative discussion, as well as all our participants. Uh, there were plenty of informative and thoughtful questions that I think made for a really rich discussion this evening. Um, additionally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our next event will be on May 19th with James Sterrett uh, concerning the use of war gaming and military education. Uh, that link for our event page will again be placed in the chat if you don't already have it. Um, and with that, Rex, do you have any final words before we sign off? No, other, other than to praise the Georgetown University Wargaming Society for having so many, leaving aside mine, um, excellent talks on excellent subjects. It, it, I think you've really become part of the, the wargaming furniture that, that, you know, people know these things are happening. You get big audiences and, and, and really you're, you're pushing the envelope. So terrific initiative. And I think on behalf of everyone who's listening, I want to thank you for the work that, that uh, you've all been doing at, uh, at your end. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I'd also extend that to Sebastian Bay, who has done a great job in advising us as our faculty advisor and coordinating Helping to coordinate all always of wise to, to thank the person who grades you. Of yeah. course, of course, always. Um, so with that, everybody, uh, have a good evening, and hopefully we see you at future events.